already at this point. So thank you everyone for joining us here in person in the room and joining us online. Um, today I'm going to give you a whirlwind tour of uh, continuing the story that Jan started, uh, which is now looking at how modeling and simulation uh, plays a role in uh, how we generate evidence to get products on the market. So uh, I wanted to start with uh, this idea that together the clinicians, the software developers, the, the device manufacturers, the drug developers, that together uh, by leveraging technology today, we can improve patient outcomes today uh, with the things that are already on the market. And that with modeling and simulation, we can also accelerate innovation, health and wellness for the technologies that we intend to bring to the market in the future. So um, at ANSYS, we've been working across the, the healthcare ecosystem to try and advance the use of these technologies in, uh, in the regulatory uh, applications. So uh, maybe if you paid some, you some extra money and you're sitting close up front, you may be able to read this timeline, um, but otherwise uh, it, it will be here. Uh, but across the top is in gold are all the uh, activity by regulators and standards groups to, uh, to, to help codify all the rules, all the guidances, um, all the legislation necessary to uh, apply modeling and simulation in, these, in, in the space across geographies and to, to help with the regulatory approval of, of these technologies. Across the bottom are the activities by uh, members of the modeling and simulation community. This includes regulators, um, uh, representatives from uh, manufacturing companies, pharmaceutical companies, um, software companies, all participating in uh, advancing reports, advancing uh, example applications uh, across geographies, ranging from uh, the Americas, North America, South America, uh, the APAC region, as well as Europe. And then these are all the different types of agencies and uh, public-private partnerships uh, that have been involved in that process. And again, uh, these, these groups span the globe. So some of the uh, work product out of, out of that uh, uh, regulatory activity um, is uh, represented here. So on the far left was the, one of the landmark guidances that Jan mentioned earlier, which is the ASME BNB40. And that creates a standard for how to report on modeling and simulation. Um, there's a publication in 2019 in the New England Journal of Medicine by the FDA uh, that speaks to how to use computer-based modeling to create uh, virtual patients and to reduce the size of clinical, clinical trials. Um, and these last two publications on the right are uh, publications that came out in the last, uh, this last calendar year. So, uh, in the middle is a landscape report uh, on the use of modeling and simulation in the medical device industry. Uh, the next one over is uh, by the Insilico UK group that was recently launched, uh, I think last year. And uh, this one speaks to uh, the economic uh, impact of modeling and simulation in healthcare. And then the third one, or the final one on the right, uh, came out a couple of weeks ago from the FDA, and it's on how to establish the credibility of the computational model. <clears throat> so, uh, I mentioned that we're going to focus on silico clinical trials or clinical studies. So clinical studies are at the core of how we generate knowledge and inform regulatory and clinical practice. So uh, in the U.S., the, the Code of Federal Regulations uh, defines what is valid scientific evidence, and it's well-controlled investigations conducted by qualified experts that report on significant human experience and provide a reasonable assurance of safety and effectiveness. So uh, the traditional forms for these are shown on the right. This is our animal study, defense testing, and human clinical trial. And as mentioned, uh, we'll be, we've been focusing on uh, increasing the, the use and application of in silico modeling uh, in this ecosystem. And one of the things that uh, the regulators and the clinical community have been increasingly appreciating is that uh, experiments are also models of reality. And experiments can be viewed as uh, a full reality partially revealed. It's almost impossible to measure cross length and size scale simultaneously in the same experiment. So you cannot fully understand everything that's happening in the experiment. Um, and that simulation, although it's a partial representation of reality, you can look at everything that is happening inside that simulation. So together, these actually create a complementary set of uh, uh, methods to generate evidence um, that will uh, help us to inform uh, decision making. So when we look at clinical studies, it's actually a little bit more complex. So uh, what we're looking at across the top of the screen is the product life cycle. So going from 
uh, research and development into preclinical or animal studies uh, into uh, a clinical trial, um, and then a regulatory submission, manufacturing, and then product release. And the three types or the three stages of clinical studies are listed underneath, uh, along with their relative sizes. So you have the first uh, stage where the first in human studies are performed, which is kind of like uh, the proof of feasibility of, of the therapy that you're investigating. Those typically have less than 30 patients in them. Um, you, then the next one is when uh, you actually create the clinical trial that uh, is responsible for the approval um, of the device so demonstrating the safety and effectiveness. Those can have 100 to 1,000 patients. And just to give you a sense for the economic impact of that, um, uh, the average patient in a clinical study in the U.S. is about $40,000. Um, some uh, studies, depending on how invasive they are, each patient can cost up to $150,000. So uh, using simulation to uh, impact that number can have a profound impact on whether or not a product would actually get to a clinical trial. Um, and then the third one is the post-market stage. Um, hopefully there's no regulatory people in the, <laughs> within the sound of my voice, but this is kind of hedging, hedging your bets. So uh, you approve the device, but you still want to understand whether it's, it's going to do what you want uh, when it's out in the public. So you continue to monitor uh, how that device is performing after it's released. So now you're, you're monitoring thousands of patients and collecting that data. So um, underneath, I've given kind of a, a sense for uh, the style of uh, digital twin or virtual patient that you can employ in each of these stages. So in that exploratory stage where the patient numbers are low, um, you can actually do patient-specific modeling. Uh, in that middle stage, you need to think about whether you're going to be patient-specific or if you're going to virtually generate a population of patients that are similar to the ones that you intend to receive your treatment. And then on the far right, um, patient-specific is pretty much out of the question because of the size and scale of those studies. So now you're looking at digital twin type of technologies or virtual patient type of technologies. So um, each of these forms of evidence, as I mentioned, have different strengths and weaknesses. This is a nice publication from 2017 by the FDA where they compare animal studies, benchtop testing, clinical trials, and uh, computer simulation. And as you can see, if you go vertically down a particular column, no form of evidence is solid green uh, all the way down, which means that no single form of evidence is able to answer all the questions that uh, the regulators care about. And then if you go horizontally, uh, you can see that uh, there's no row where everything is green. So uh, for a particular question, uh, you actually need a combination of uh, different forms of evidence to be able to answer that question. Um, one of the interesting things is uh, that row where it says it can predict performance with few, uh, few assumptions, uh, that row that's highlighted in red. And as you can see that even the clinical trial, which is the gold standard for evidence generation, is unable to predict um, performance with few assumptions. So the next few slides kind of speak through uh, what are the challenges in, uh, in doing clinical studies and understanding how devices are interacting with patients that uh, modeling and simulation is positioned to address. So this first one is um, that patients don't live sedated in the hospital and that they actually have a lot of outside of a medical scanner. So uh, as soon as the patient wakes up, their blood pressure changes, their heart rate changes, vascular tone changes, everything changes about, what they, about the physiological state. And uh, we need to understand how the clinical endpoints that we're trying to predict in a clinical study are impacted by the change in the physiological state of the patient. So some of the ones that are listed uh, at the bottom of that slide are um, perivalvular leakage. So PVL is the valve going to leak um, after the patient wakes up and they're walking or running. Um, is the device going to move? Uh, is it going to be durable? Is it going to survive what the, the person is doing over the course of the, their activities of daily living? Um, is it going to fatigue? Is there going to be erosion of the device into tissue? All of those things um, we actually can't observe clinically, and we need an alternative form of evidence to generate that. The next one, um, we, we heard about AI and machine learning already and uh, generation of data and accumulation of data. Um, uh, when, we, when we look at a data approach and uh, data analytics based on uh, the data that's been collected in the clinical study, um, it is positioned for interpolation. It is not positioned for extrapolation. And an example of the difference between uh, interpolation and extrapolation is shown, uh, shown below. So, um, when we construct clinical studies, there are a lot of things that we are not ethically allowed to do. We are not allowed to implant a broken device into a patient to look at how it behaves. 
we are not allowed to induce failure of a device in a patient to see how it behaves. So how are we going to develop methods to predict whether the device is heading towards failure or, um, or has failed already? Um, how do we understand what's going on in the pediatric population? So um, data is not going to give us that. And we can't cross outside of the data that we've collected into that extrapolation zone because all bets are off in terms of uh, the tools that we have to analyze that space, either statistical or uh, AI-based. <clears throat> The next problem has to do with the clinical trials. And clinical trials are, conduct, are designed and conducted in a very specific way. Patients are carefully selected. We have the best practitioners performing those clinical studies, and the patients get the best follow-up. And uh, this is by design because it reduces the signal-to-noise ratio in those studies, so we can really understand how the device is performing and whether it's performing as intended and whether it's truly safe. But the question is, how are they going to, uh, to, to behave when it's exposed to that more general population. Um, I know every clinical practitioner is fantastic, but we're not all the same. So um, when you introduce that variability, what's going to happen? So uh, on the right is sanitized data from, um, from clinical study. And the, the curve in red is um, kind of the error bound around uh, a particular survival uh, metric uh, that was being tracked in that device um, related to failure. And you can see that the clinical study gives you a nice tight red band in there, and then, uh, I'm sorry, the clinical trial, and then the clinical study after the device was released gives you that blue band, which is much wider, and you can, there's a threshold of acceptable risk associated with that, and the red band doesn't cross it, but a portion of the blue band does. So um, how can we prevent, or how can we predict uh, that this will happen, and how do we intervene to uh, shift these curves up or to uh, better uh, limit the, the types of patients that are exposed to the therapy um, that would cross that acceptable risk line. So this third one, again, uh, has the product life cycle. And uh, these color codes have to do with your data volume. So red means you, there's no way you're going to do statistics or, uh, or AI on that data because it's too small. Um, the orange zone is um, you, you can, but you're at risk. And then green is when you, you're pretty safe with those uh, statistical methods or AI-based methods to uh, address these questions. So uh, as you can see, uh, in a traditional build and test approach, um, the data is very scarce. And we need to, to figure out how we can uh, increase the confidence, especially as devices get more complex. These numbers are appalling in terms of being able to cover the design space uh, for a particular device. So by introducing modeling and simulation, now you have the opportunity to develop that right volume of data at the right level, um, at the right time, and it's limited by your compute power or just your will. Um, so uh, here uh, we can amplify uh, the benchtop testing data with simulation. We can amplify cadaver testing. We can amplify uh, animal studies, and we can certainly amplify uh, human data uh, using virtual patients. And just to give a sense, I have been involved in studies where one modeler was able to generate 200 virtual patients um, in the course of two months. That would have taken more than two years uh, to do that in the physical world. <clears throat> so when we talk about creating virtual patients or doing in silico clinical trials, um, how do we build those? And this, this slide uh, kind of gives a brief overview of that. We have to have on the far right the ability to simulate the patient, the physiology, the portion of the body that's of interest. We have to have the ability to simulate the device. And then uh, on the far left, we're interested in use conditions. So what did the clinician do when they implanted the device? Um, what's the patient going to do when they leave the hospital? And how do all of these things work together? Now, a big, a big challenge for all of that is the variability in biology and the uncertainty in the ability that we have to measure. And uh, listed below are some of the sources of that variability and uncertainty um, in uh, each of these three categories. And uh, just to uh, give an illustration, um, if you were posed with the question of do I cut the red wire or the blue wire, and uh, you have two sources of data for cutting the red wire, one of them has no variability or uncertainty associated with it, and it says to cut the red one. The second one says cut the red one, but I'm about 30% uncertain that that's the right one to cut. And then the blue one says I am 95% sure that the blue wire is the right one to cut. So Variability and uncertainty have a big deal in how you weight the evidence in your decision-making process. 
So what we've been doing at ANSYS is developing the tools in simulation uh, to better allow us to represent the biology. A lot of the work has already gone into the engineering devices. So what we're showing here is work that's been done in, a multi, in the multi-physics uh, domain. So we're looking at the electrical behavior of the heart. And in this particular case, the electrical activity has been tuned or calibrated to the patient's EKG uh, to develop this pattern. And this also gives us the opportunity to do things like, again, if you're in the expensive seats in the front, uh, you may be able to see a network of electrical conduction uh, system in the bottom half of the heart. And you can introduce pathology there, like conduction blocks, uh, things that would influence the uh, electrical behavior and look at that effect. So this model, the electrical activity drives the muscle activation. So what we're looking at now is the same heart being driven uh, with electrical activation. So we have the capability in our tool set now to have uh, uh, an a la carte uh, menu of uh, microstructurally informed material models for tissues. So if you can look under the microscope and say uh, this tissue has uh, fibers running in a particular direction or multiple fibers running in different directions, you can represent that in the tissue model. And then you can also choose whether to add in muscle activation uh, to those models. So um, this is a simulation that has all of that in there. So it's calculating actually the, um, the tissue stresses and uh, the flow dynamics in this model but it's been abstracted to create the traces on the left and the right of the model. So the abstractions on the left and the right are taking the simulation data and converting it back to pressure versus time traces that clinicians are more used to making decisions on uh, in their clinical practice. So they don't have to learn engineering jargon, engineering parlance. Um, we can take a clinical image, enrich the data from that image and present it back to uh, the clinical specialists in their own language that they can use to make a decision. So uh, what we've been also working on, um, and Nils is here in the audience, he's, he's been kind of the mastermind behind this activity, uh, is working with uh, shape memory alloys uh, in, uh, in the medical device sector. So this is a transcatheter aortic valve uh, that um, uh, he's demonstrated the ability to, um, to, to simulate the manufacturing process or the forming process to induce the shape set um, for that material so that when you pack it into a catheter and release it in the body, it returns to that shape. And then um, we've also uh, developed uh, simulations to look at what happens when uh, that device is deployed in a patient-specific anatomy. So um, I kind of jumped through that quickly. There we go. Uh, so what you're looking at, the indications for use of this device talk about the fact that um, if you implant the device more deeply in the anatomy, that uh, you'll get better sealing and lower incidence of leakage. So what does it look like if, uh, we target, if the clinician targets three different positions and how can we evaluate the functional behavior of that device? So this is a simulation of the deployment at three different depths in the anatomy. And then uh, looking at the functional flow simulation uh, for the behavior of that device in the patient. So, uh, on the left, uh, what you see are those jets uh, uh, coming out of the bottom of the device. That's bad, and we don't want that to happen. And you can see that, indeed, as you uh, implant that device uh, deeper in the anatomy, that uh, you, can, you can prevent those jets from occurring. Um, in a model like this, you can also do the things we talked about earlier in the presentation, like increasing the heart rate, increasing the blood pressure, and assessing how this happens uh, when the patient's no longer sedated on the table. So what's the impact of all this? Has, this? has this had any value in the marketplace? And uh, I'm showing uh, examples from uh, different parts of the ecosystem that I mentioned before. Uh, Medtronic has spoken about uh, examples of being able to reduce the number of endpoints in a clinical trial. So for this device, which is a pacemaker that has no leads, it's implanted directly in the wall of the heart. Uh, they were able to reduce the number of patients in that clinical study by 250. Which, is, which had a huge impact on uh, not just the cost of the clinical trial, but they were allowed to get to market two years earlier because of how long it would have taken to enroll those additional 250 patients. The Medical Device Innovation Consortium had uh, another uh, 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 study that they performed where um, they worked on how to uh, look at whether the clinical trial population was producing the same results as the virtual population and they developed a statistical method to scale uh, the computational evidence based on how well it correlated. 
So that, that work has been published. So there's a computational means for how to combine uh, these two different sources of evidence. Uh, many manufacturers have done uh, this expanding the claims around their device, which increases the market, increases the number of patients that can benefit from the device. Um, what the most noteworthy one is around MR safety. So uh, is the device going to be safe if, if uh, the patient is placed in a scanner? And as many of you probably know, that's a, that's a class five risk. Um, it could cause severe damage to the patient and possible death. So that's not something you want to test in a clinical study. Um, so uh, here, this was a multi-year uh, hierarchical validation process going from do the models predict binge, do they predict animal studies, and then crossing over into the models being applied to virtual patients. Um, so that's a really beautiful story. And then the last box is blank because we didn't want to call out any devices in particular. Um, but uh, doing uh, forensic analysis after uh, a device fails in the field to understand why that failure happened and how to remediate it. Um, so, um, unfortunately, uh, patients have been harmed by uh, devices, and uh, this has been an effective way. Uh, modeling and simulation has proven really valuable to um, addressing those types of questions. Mm -hmm. And it's, it was actually the first application of modeling and simulation in space, and we've been trying to move it earlier in the product life cycle. So, uh, my last slide is, is where do we need to go? And this this, this really focuses on the challenge that we have of relating the things that models can predict to the things that matter to the clinician and the things that matter to patients. So um, uh, in the middle of the slide, it's, it has clinical endpoints listed. So uh, there are things like major adverse events uh, that the clinician might care about. Does the device cause an embolism? Is it going to uh, kink uh, while I'm trying to deploy it? Is it going to, uh, uh, is, is there going to be disease later on that, that reoccurs after the device has been placed? those types of questions. So we need a mechanistic understanding of how these types of endpoints relate to the things that we can do in simulation to be able to close this gap. And then the one on the far right is probably the most challenging, and these are the clinical endpoints that the patient cares about. So is it going to increase my risk of death? Is it going to increase my risk for something like uh, being paralyzed? Um, am I going to have a higher stroke risk after this device is implanted? So those types of questions are, are a bit more challenging for modeling and simulation to address. But again, a lot of work is going on uh, to be able to include those types of physiological effects and capture them in simulation uh, to be able to uh, inform these types of endpoints. So uh, with that, I'll close. And thank you for your attention. We have uh, five minutes if you guys would like to ask any questions. I have a question. Um, I don't worry, I'm not regulatory, but I come from a Sierra background. So it's more of a general question. How do you feel that simulation is um, received in the regulatory environment, maybe in the United States as well as abroad? Yeah, so um, I think the, I'll, I'll start with the second one. Um, I think the US, the United States has a bit of an advantage because um, the regulatory organization has a research organization directly attached to it. And, And it's those, uh, the Office of Science and Engineering Laboratories at the FDA have been really driving, helping to translate it over to uh, the regulatory evaluation side of the FDA. Uh, unfortunately, the other geographies don't have an arrangement like that. So it's a bit more challenging to uh, advance the conversation. But the rules are there in MDR. Um, they're probably not well known. And uh, just like in the US, in the US, it varies depending on uh, what part of the body uh, is being modeled and who those reviewers are. Um, Cardiovascular certainly has a significant advantage as this orthopedic. Uh, some of the other uh, other ones, it's more challenging to uh, work with those regulators on modeling and simulation just because they don't have the exposure or the experience. And that's probably the same uh, in Europe, for example, with uh, with uh, the different um, notified bodies. 